afternoon and thank you all so much for coming to today's program. My name is Melissa Loriano and I serve as the programs manager for the DC Preservation League. For those of you new to DCPO, we are a citywide nonprofit organization founded in 1971 that is dedicated to preserving, protecting, and enhancing the historic built environment of Washington, DC through advocacy and education. I'd like to first take a moment to acknowledge some of DCPL's top sponsors whose annual financial support helps underwrite public programs like this one today. They are the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities, Denton's, Douglas Development, Antunovich Associates, Atlantic Refinishing and Restoration, Fire Blender Bell, Building Innovation Hub, EHT Traceries, and KCE Structural Engineers. I also want to thank Evergreen Architectural Arts for their support as both a sponsor and for their participation in today's program. Additionally, as part of our 50th anniversary celebration programs this month are specifically dedicated to highlighting monuments and memorials in the district. And so I also want to thank Edwin Fountain for his generosity sponsoring this month's programming as well. So with that, I am so pleased to introduce you all to today's speakers. Judy Scott Feldman is a native Washingtonian, a former member of the board of the DC Preservation League and a founder and chair of the nonprofit National Mall Coalition. The coalition founded in 2000 by DC and Metro area residents advocates comprehensive visionary planning for the mall. In the tradition of the 1791 LaFont plan and 1901 McMillan plan to ensure the vitality of this historic and national treasure for future generations. An art historian, Judy taught art and architecture history at American University and teaches and lectures for the Smithsonian Associates, um, OSHA at John Hopkins and Rhodes Scholar on various topics, including the art and architectural history of Washington and the mall. Since 2015, <clears throat> excuse me. Since 2015, Edwin Fountain has served as general counsel of the American Battle Monuments Commission, the federal agency that maintains American military cemeteries and memorials around the world. Edwin was a board member of the DC Preservation League from 2001 to 2007, including three years as its president. His involvement with DCPL led to him starting the effort to restore the District of Columbia War Memorial and then advocating before Congress for a national World War I memorial as well. This led to his appointment in 2013 to the US World War I Centennial Commission. As vice chair of that commission, he led the development of the new National World War I Memorial at Pershing Park in Washington. Um, Mark Rabinowitz is president of Evergreen Architectural Arts and holds decades of experience in the assessment, testing, and treatment of major historic and artistic works in the US, Canada, and the Caribbean. Mark is a graduate of Rhode Island School of Design. He holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts and worked as a sculptor for the first 16 years of his career. His experience in preservation ranges from monuments, sculptures, and fountains to industrial artifacts and historic sites. Some significant projects include the assessment of the Egyptian obelisk in New York City, assessment and treatment of the Grant, Lincoln, and World War I memorials on the National Mall, and conservation of monuments in Arlington and national cemeteries nationwide. So we are going to, I want to thank them all first for joining us today, and we'll hear from them momentarily. Um, but first, if I can get my slideshow to work, there we go. <laughs> We're going to talk about um, the DC War Memorial. So we're going to talk about the DC War Memorial first, um, and then we're going to hear about the World War I Memorial, and then we're going to hear about the World War II Memorial. So here's where we will begin. So I'm just going to give you all a brief history of the District of Columbia War Memorial, just to give you some background of how it came to be and who it memorializes. Although it is found on the National Mall, it's a memorial that I think gets overlooked quite a bit, um, even by DC residents, um, which I think, and Rebecca and Edwin can talk more to this, which is probably influenced it being listed on DCPL's most endangered places list um, in the past. <clears throat> um, I also wanna mention that the memorial was officially added to the DC Inventory of Historic Sites in 2013 and to the National Register of Historic Places in 2014. And it was nominated by the National Park Service, who is its steward. 
So um, as I mentioned, the memorial is located on the National Mall within the heart of West Potomac Park. It's just south of the Lincoln Memorial Reflecting Pool, as you can see there on the map. Um, east of the Korean War Veterans Memorial and north of the Tidal Basin and Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial. <clears throat> so a month after the First World War ended, Washingtonians were already submitting letters to the U.S. Commission of Fine Arts to design and construct a memorial for the city's veterans and fallen soldiers. The landmark nomination even states that, quote, Washington was among the highest contributors of soldiers per capita among cities and states. The House of Representatives introduced a resolution to establish an official commission to oversee the completion of the memorial in April 1920. However, it wasn't until 1924 that the commission was formally established. They oversaw the design process and fundraising. Um, the design was selected in 1925, which I will get more into in a moment, and the campaign for funding officially launched in April 1926. Um, and here are some photographs from the Historic American Building Survey. So the fundraising campaign lasted about five years with the needed cost for construction initially being $200,000. Um, it was eventually reduced to $155,000 though. This effort to raise uh, money, to raise this money was really community led. And I think that's a really important part of uh, the story of this memorial's history and its kind of significance to the DC community. Volunteers, uh, many of whom were gold star mothers, went door to door to ask for donations. It was advertised in local newspapers like the Evening Star. And there was even a short film created about the memorial, which I believe also included footage of DC residents actually fighting in the war that uh, local theaters would show as well to help garner support and funding for the project. I believe it may have received some federal funding, um, but it wasn't a lot and the majority of it came from the community because it was a, a local memorial. All right. So after five years of this funding, the District of Columbia War Memorial was completed in 1931 to commemorate the 26,000 DC residents who fought in World War I and to recognize the 499 individuals who died in service. So on the left here, there's um, a nice drawing that's featured in the Sunday Star of the Memorial. And it was also to advertise the dedication ceremony, um, which you can see there on the right. Um, so in the years following its dedication, the memorial saw many commemorative events and outdoor concerts. Uh, the Marine Band was a group that performed often in this space. However, by the late 1930s, the site was already showing signs of some deterioration. The Public Works Administration provided a grant to rehabilitate the memorial and its landscape in 1939. Um, which helped fix it up. But uh, over time, water infiltration was steadily eating away at the memorial's integrity. And it wasn't until about a decade ago that um, significant rehabilitation work would be completed, which Mark will get into more in a moment. All right. <clears throat> Um, but for now, I'm just going to finish up with a little information about the architects and to show some additional photos of the memorial and some of its features. It was designed by architect Frederick H. Brooke, along with associate architects uh, Horace Peasley and Nathan Wyeth, who were all veterans of World War I themselves. Um, and as you can see in the caption here, this design was originally submitted to the Fine Arts Commission in 1919, but like I mentioned, it wasn't actually officially, um, uh, oh my God, my words, it wasn't accepted until 1925. So there was some time in between that. It's designed in the form of a circular Greek temple as an open air white marble structure with 12 columns supporting its domed roof. It is flanked by ash woods and surrounded by an open lawn and grove of trees. Um, and its surrounding kind of lawn is also a cultural landscape, which the work that was done in 1935, the nomination mentions how that kind of had a significant effect on that, on the look of the landscape or the original design. 
Um, it was also designed to be a bandstand, like I mentioned, and with the idea that the concerts taking place there would be a tribute to those who served. Um, and this is just uh, the design of the floor of the memorial, just to show you all that. Um, and you can see on the left, there's an insignia that uh, references the First World War and to the right, um, an engraving of the architect's names near the stairs. <clears throat> um, and to the left here, um, you can see some of the names engraved on the memorial of those who had died in service. Um, like I mentioned, there are 499 names listed in total. And an interesting fact about this is that the names are in alphabetical order. And I say this is an interact, as interesting fact for the time in which it was constructed, but the names are listed in alphabetical order with no distinction or segregation based on race and gender. Um, and in addition to these panels, the north stairway is flanked by two other panels. Um, and the right one is there in the second photo there, and it reads, this memorial was erected through the voluntary subscriptions of the people of Washington. It was dedicated on Armistice Day 1931 by Herbert Hoover, President of the United States. Within this cornerstone are recorded the names of the 26,000 Washingtonians who when the United States entered the World War answered the call to arms and served in the Army, Navy, Marine Corps and Coast Guard. Um, I don't have a photo of the other panel, but this is the quote that is included on that. Um, and it reads, the names of the men and women from the District of Columbia who gave their lives in the World War are here inscribed as a perpetual record of their patriotic service to their country. Those who fell and those who survived have given to this and to the future generations an example of high idealism, courageous sacrifice and gallant achievement. Um, and here we have some photos from the 2011 reopening ceremony. Um, and I wanna kind of invite Rebecca and Edwin, if you wanted to talk about some of the advocacy that went into getting funding for the restoration that happened. And I guess, you know, why it was on the most endangered places list, how that helped it, um, I guess, any sort of background information. Well, Melissa, as you indicated, uh, DCPL put the memorial on its most endangered list in 2006 or seven, I believe. Um, it actually appeared twice on the most endangered list, once in its own right, and then once as representative of the overall condition of the mall. Um, and uh, we actually had our press conference announcing its uh, include uh, announcing the that year's most endangered list at the DC Memorial in 2007, I think. Um, we had seen an estimate that uh, preliminary estimate from the Park Service that would cost about a million dollars to restore it. Um, we haven't shown any before photos, but the paving all around it was all cracked and broken. There was significant water damage. There was significant biological staining on the roof. Uh, there was a um, tree growing out of the roof. Tree growing out of the roof at <laughs> one point. Um, uh, you know, the the lettering was uh, you know dirty and cracked and. And so this was back when uh, when congressional earmarks were a good thing. So we decided this would be a perfect project for a congressional earmark or barring that private fundraising. So we started a small foundation to uh, to accomplish that. Our ace in the hole in this effort was a gentleman named Frank Buckles, who ultimately became the last American veteran of World War One. And he signed on as honorary chairman to this uh, to, to, to the foundation. There's a photo of him in his wheelchair in front of the DC War Memorial, uh, showing how cracked all the paving was, how difficult it was for him to get around. There's Frank on the left. So Frank got us a lot of publicity. Uh, we even made the cover of Parade Magazine, uh, among other things. Uh, he appeared on Capitol Hill uh, at a Senate hearing. Um, and the, the, the upshot of that was after President Obama uh, and Congress passed the, uh, the stimulus bill in 2009 during the financial crisis, the Park Service was awarded $500 million for capital improvement projects. And all of the Park Service units around the country competed internally for that money. 
And you can either say that we embarrassed the Park Service enough so that they, they took some of that money, or that through our advocacy, we had raised the profile of this memorial enough so that it rose high enough on the list uh, that it received some of that stimulus money along with the Jefferson Memorial seawall work and then the Lincoln Reflecting Pool restoration. So ultimately the restoration was funded by the Park Service uh, to the tune of three point something million dollars. Um, is, but this, is, this, this shows that everyone's all excited when they build a memorial and then it's gotta be restored. There's a tail to the funding. And DC War was a bit of an orphan in that it was uh, sort of thought of as a District of Columbia memorial, but it sat on Park Service land. And so they both sort of, you know, let the fly ball drop between them and the Park Service, you know, which is strapped for cash and, and the mall has obviously lots of demands on it, you know, did charitably the bare minimum. I'm not even sure you can say that uh, to keep up the site. So when you talk about restoration of sites, we'll talk about this with, World, with the Pershing Park, you got to have the money. Um, and that's a, a constant theme that I think we're all aware of when it comes to preservation. Absolutely. Rebecca, I think, uh, well, certainly I'd like to talk a little bit about the district's non-role in this, given that it is a DC war memorial. And we'd approached the DC council on a number of occasions to uh, earmark funds there as well in their budget to restore this. And they kept telling us that it wasn't their problem. It was in fact, the National Park Service problem, even though it was a DC war memorial. Uh, when Edwin and I participated, uh, we planned the reopening celebration. Uh, it was 2011. When it, and we held it on Veterans Day that year. And the interesting part of that was our Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, and also our, our uh, at that point it was our mayor, Vincent Gray, wanted to turn this into a voting rights rally, which was so interesting to me, given that they had had no interest in this memorial prior to it actually being uh, nicely restored at this point. Uh, so there, these are images that you're seeing on your screen now from that celebration. Uh, it was a really, it was a great moment to have this uh, back in productive use. And we've seen lots of uh, different concerts that have taken place there and also a lot of weddings that we see. There's a lot of permits that are issued for weddings at this particular memorial because it is such a nice site now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I don't know if either of you have any other final thoughts about it. Um, but otherwise we're gonna move into kind of Mark's portion and he's gonna talk about um, some of the rest, like the physical restoration of the site. That sounds great, thank you. Hi, um, so I'm Mark Rabinowitz, currently president and principal conservator with Evergreen. We're a large specialty contractor who does a lot of restoration throughout the United States. We've worked on 20, sorry, 38 state and federal capitals and many, many monuments. Um, it's a fascinating and challenging um, field and one I'm very proud to be able to contribute to our nation's capital through. Uh, the next slide, you can see the efforts that we started at the um, DC War uh, Memorial. Um, it is made of marble and is intended to represent this design of materials the kind of permanence that the uh, memorial should represent, the ideals of sacrifice and valor. Um, materials uh, deteriorate and marble has a unique characteristic, which is that it is a metamorphic stone, which means it started once as limestone, but through compression by being pressed underneath mountains, literally under the millions and millions of pounds of pressure, it crystallizes and turns into the beautiful translucent so we know it is that crystalline creation process, however, ends up uh, leaving always these little voids between the crystals, which are water soluble, they're uncrystallized limestone, and they inherently leave vulnerability in marble uh, structures. So where marble is exposed to the uh, water and the elements in its roof, for example, uh, it will eventually find its way through those crystals and uh, migrate into the structure or out of it. And here we see some of the examples of what has happened, the typical grayish uh, stains, which were ubiquitous of uh, biological growth that uh, exists through water sitting in those little 
uh, gaps between the crystals and, and feeding various different uh, microorganisms. Uh, other staining that was on the monument included the uh, that that was coming off of the, the capitals. You see it, the sort of stain running down there. That's a bituminous waterproofing that was put between the two domes. If you remember the drawing that Melissa put up, there's a lower dome, which we see it shows the, the, from the inside the monument and then the actual marble dome above it. And in that gap, uh, there's a waterproofing to, to, to keep water from dripping through. That waterproofing gets liquefied in the intense heat of DC summers, we all know that, and it migrated its way down to where, where it was dripping out from the capital. Uh, there also is a reddish uh, stain, which is a second arrow there, which is somewhat related to the same very high uh, temperature conditions and the porosity of the stone. It's actually um, lead. Uh, lead is used in setting beds of, of marble to cushion it as the blocks are, are placed on top of each other. And lead, when it's in combination with cement in very high temperatures, will form a, a weird uh, lead oxide, which is orange and red. And it will migrate through the stone um, to the surface as, as water evaporates. That's what we see there. Uh, that's what we still see. So next slide, please. Uh, initial studies of this had found very difficult uh, difficulty removing some of these stains and soiling. The, chemicals that are typically used and were typically used in the, around that time in the early aughts um, had not been effective in, in, in cleaning the staining that was expected to be found. Uh, what we were able to determine with our test was we were engaged through a architectural firm by the Park Service to test the cleaning methods and eventually specify how it could, should be restored, uh, was that they, a waterproofing treatment had been applied. This was uh, you know, in the period, probably the 1980s, a sort of better living through chemistry period, where uh, a silicone was applied to the marble to try and stop that problem of the water moving in and out of those tiny little micro fissures between the crystals. Uh, it works to some degrees, but it has a deleterious effect of actually stopping water from migrating out of it. And it also stops uh, cleaning agents from getting to it. So the biological growth, the stains were living underneath that waterproofing and were not able to be accessed through the cleaning process and the, the, the monument could not be cleaned. Once we determined that, we figured out a means of reversing that waterproofing using a chemical, and then we could actually get at the stains. Then using a combination of careful microabrasion on the uh, bituminous uh, stains from the waterproofing and chemical cleaning, uh, and, and heat and uh, uh, hot water for the biological, we were able to re reverse all of the actual staining. Next slide, please. These were some of the tests we did. Uh, we follow the ethics of the Park Service uh, and the American Institute for Conservation, which presume that the lowest level of intervention capable of achieving the goals is what should be done. We try to minimize our treatments to, uh, to try to ensure that we do no damage, just like helpful like doctors. And further, we try and make sure that everything is fully documented and uh, capable of being retreated in the future because we know that maintenance will be required no matter how carefully and thoroughly we do our work, it will not be the last time this monument is treated. So this is just an example of some of the tests we did before the work was occurred. After we determined the methodologies to be used, they were integrated into specifications for restoration of the monument, including repointing, work on the, the pavings, adjacent landscaping, and so on. And then next slide, uh, that, that work was integrated into actual treatment. The, the, the monument was scaffolded and a contractor performed the work according to our specifications. We were engaged to oversee that uh, and ensure compliance. And it was a successful treatment, which in the next slide and the ones you see previously shows the, it, it's quite beautiful. So in the next slide. Um, there, however, you do see that reddish stain. Um, those lead uh, stains are not reversible. No one has yet been able to figure out how to get remobilize that and leach that um, lead out of the stone. So unfortunately that reddish stain remains and you'll see it, it it's more, more commonly found in the South. Uh, you can see it also in a similar condition in the Arlington National Cemetery, the amphitheater, um, where if they haven't actually replaced the stones, you still find that 
uh, it's a weird and anomalous stain that's, that's common to DC, unfortunately. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so on the theme of white marble domed monuments on the mall and adjacent, this is the Jefferson Memorial that we just recently finished working on as well. Um, a very similar structure, a, a, a domed circular Roman um, temple and Tempietto, in this case a full temple, uh, which also had a very strong biological staining problem, uh, possibly related to a similar um, water repellent treatment, although we've not been able to confirm th that, but it was very difficult to clean. Further, the Park Service was very concerned about being that the monument being located directly on the tidal basin. Uh, any runoff might in, uh, affect the, um, the, the fish and, and, and the maritime animals. And so we didn't want to use chemical, the Park Service didn't want to use chemical treatments to clean that biological growth. And, uh, and so uh, instead, a combination of laser cleaning and steam cleaning was, was developed and we implemented that uh, on the dome and, and uh, ex the exterior, uh, much of the exterior of the, of the monument. So if you go to the next slide, you can see some of that treatment. This was the initial steam cleaning that was performed. Um, it was logistically complicated. All the, the operators who had to be trained had to work safely, this is very hot. It's a wet steam, it's a pressurized steam. And, it's uh, over boiling temperature. Um, and it was very effective at removing uh, the biological growth. And then we followed it with a laser cleaning that removed any possible residual water uh, proofing. And then we did a final steam rinse after the, all the other work had occurred. Um, one of the things, uh, everyone had to be tied off and, and be able to work with the rope access is very complicated logistical problem. We had to wear white boots too, so we can stain the white marble with our climbing. Next slide, please. And then the laser uh, was used uh, in between the, the, the steam treatments. Uh, this is a, one of our operators doing laser cleaning. We use this on the US Capitol quite a bit and elsewhere. Uh, it's a process that was first discovered about 40 years ago. It has become more and more common in architectural settings has been in art in use in art cleaning quite a bit over the last uh, 30 years. Um, a very highly focused uh, laser beam of a certain wavelength is directed at the soiling and it is absorbed by dark uh, stains, certain kinds of dark stains, uh, and then uh, which are instantly vaporized. It doesn't damage the substrate. You have to be very careful with it because it could damage the, your, your eyes, but it is very safe for uh, cleaning in fact, it's ideal for cleaning white marble because it, it is not absorbed by the marble and so it does not do any damage to the marble. So the combination of the steam and the laser was very effective at cleaning the monument. Next slide. And if you go by it, you'll see this was the sequence further. It, was, it took years. It was a really long project. But if, uh, as you go by it now, next slide. Um, you can see that uh, it was very effective. In fact, it seems that it's actually getting whiter, uh, which makes sense because ultraviolet, which is the wavelength that the laser works in, uh, kills biological uh, growth. Uh, so in fact, by removing the, the soiling and allowing the, the sunlight to do its job, the, the monument is actually cleaning itself. That won't last forever, but for now we're, we're all enjoying the benefit of the work that we did and then the work you now that uh, nature is doing for us as well. Next slide. Uh, we also worked on the Grant Memorial. Uh, this had been a Park Service uh, project site. It's currently now under the management of the architect of the Capitol. We studied it on, uh, under the Park Service and then eventually we oversaw the restoration of it through the architect of the Capitol. Uh, it is the largest bronze monument in America. If you know, size matters, it is really big. Uh, it consists of an equestrian figure of Ulysses Grant, the four um, lions, panels of soldiers, and two massive groups of um, equestrian groups, an artillery and a, a cavalry group on either uh, north and south flanking wings. It's also on white marble. And here you can see the effects of the deterioration of the 
bronze, just like marble, metals have to be cared for and, and, and preserved and treated and coated to uh, uh, reduce their deterioration over time through exposure to weather. Fortunately, DC has had through the 19th and 20th century a much better quality air than in many other more industrial cities in North America. And that air quality has continued to improve. The records of, I saw recently over the last few years are better than they were even during the 2004. Um, but the nevertheless acidic elements in the air will deposit on, on bronze and cause it to corrode. The, the green stains you see on the marble uh, are bronze version of rust. Their deterioration, it's a pretty rust, but it's still a deterioration and actually eroding of the metal. Uh, so while the company name is Evergreen, our job in bronzes is not to make them green. Next slide. So this is the, uh, the cavalry group um, before the treatment. You can see how uh, incredibly complicated it is. It consists, I think, of nine different uh, horse figures uh, riding, chasing. Every one of these was modeled with incredible detail. We found in the restoration we had to replace, uh, I think it was 56 different separate elements that had been lost through climbing or wear or or vandalism, bridles and, and swords and tassels and, and so on. It was a, a remarkably detailed effort. The sculptor, uh, Henry Mervyn uh, Schrady, worked for over 20 years on this group. In fact, it was his life's work. Next slide, please. He even... Um, Put himself in it. The uh, figure of the fallen horseman um, and that's in the front of the cavalry is a self-portrait. And it's uh, poignant because, in fact, he, after the long, long years of effort, decades of effort on this, he passed away two weeks before the dedication of the monument. So we never actually got to see it in its final uh, display. This is the appearance that it has. There is a casting of one of the groups that is in uh, Wyoming, that we studied that, we studied all of his patinas, we figured out what the original patina was and brought it close to that, that original patina now through a process of cleaning and, and chemical repatination and coating. Um, the, while that, that green is a very pretty rust, the, if you look at this, you'll see how, how much more visible are all of the sculptor's efforts, all the bridles, all the very careful detailing on the uniforms. Um, all the years and years and years of effort that made into carefully depicting this is visible now because of the treatment of the, of the bronze. Next slide. And this is a detail of the artillery group uh, showing the same thing after the cleaning and patination process uh, and, and before the coating. Um, again, it's just astonishingly um, carefully done work um, very also thoroughly researched. He actually joined the, the army for a, a while so he could understand how all of the, the tools were used. And considering it was started in around 1900 and completely 1920, the intention was to make it seem like a photograph. That was his words, that it has this instantaneous moment. And it really does capture that, which is quite extraordinary. Next slide. Well, at the same time, there's the poise and elegance of the, the lion figures. Next slide. And we've been engaged regularly by the architect of the Capitol who return and perform maintenance on these, uh, just as you need to wash and wax your car. Um, the outdoor metals have to be washed and waxed uh, regularly so that the coating as it deteriorates can be renewed and, and the metals are not allowed to start deteriorating again. So, so we carefully go in and clean complete open weep, hole, weep holes, allow water to drain through the sculpture and renew the coating on a regular basis. And thank you. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Uh, really amazing work. Um, and it's, it's wonderful to see the kind of like the before and after and how great um, these, these structures are looking. Um, so next, uh, we're going to hear from Edwin about the World War I memorial. Right, and Mark, uh, 
you know, Mark provides a couple of interesting segues. Um, the World War One, the National World War One Memorial story, actually starts at DC War, uh, and it too is going to have a significant bronze uh, commemorative feature, as well as some, sub sub some subsidiary features. And we're already thinking proactively about how we're going to maintain them so that we don't have to hire Mark to restore them sometime down the road. Um, but let me call up my screen. Is it up? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, this is the National World War One Memorial, formerly known as Pershing Park. The photo on the left is uh, from the 1980s, not long after it was uh, opened. And then the photograph on the right is from its uh, reopening as the National World War I Memorial, not uh, just in April of last year. Um, I know I've got to figure out how to toggle here. There we go. Um, the, the, the lobbying for restoration of DC War Memorial uh, and this is now on, on my part and some others, this was not a DCPL effort, um, but it turned to lobbying for a National World War I Memorial, because when you stand at DC War, you can literally see the national memorials to the three other major wars of the 20th century, uh, all located around the Lincoln Reflecting Pool. And we started to think, particularly with the centennial of the war approaching, shouldn't there be a National World War I Memorial? Now we knew that the Commemorative Works Act decreed that there should be no new memorials, monuments, uh, museums, visitor centers, anything else on the National Mall. Uh, and so being a clever lawyer, I thought, well, we won't try to build a new memorial. We'll just try to expand the existing World War I Memorial, give it a national character, uh, give it some additional features to give it a national character and make it a national and DC World War I Memorial. That lobbying effort continued for about five years. Uh, we ran into several objections that I expected. We ran into other objections that I didn't expect. Um, but ultimately, after the World War I Commission was formed, I briefed them on the efforts to date. And I said, we can continue beating our head against the wall to try to get a spot on the mall, or we can go to Pershing Park, uh, which was an existing World War I memorial not far from the mall. Uh, and here it is. You see, of course, the ellipse. Uh, and the White House there and center left. You've got Pennsylvania Avenue leading up from the Capitol. Uh, and right there in red is Pershing Park with the Willard Hotel to the north, Freedom Plaza to the east, the Commerce Department to the south, and the Sherman statue to the left. So uh, it always strikes me that sites that we consider historic today were built on sites that if they still existed would be considered historic today. Uh, Pershing Park has gone through a variety of iterations over the years. This is one that I just came across on the Ghosts of DC uh, blog uh, a week or so ago. This is from the 1890s. You can see the, 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 the uh, trapezoid of Pershing Park in the, in the, on the left there between 14th and 15th streets. Uh, the lower left, the area marked three, was a theater. Uh, the upper left was a hotel. And then those dark uh, patches on the on the lot were saloons, uh, and this whole thing is talking about what was known as Murder Row or Murder Bay, actually, or Hooker's Division. Uh, it was basically the bad part of town, and the red light district back in the uh, in the 1890s. But it went through very oh, and here it is about 20 years later, uh, looking down Pennsylvania Avenue. Of course, that is General Pershing, uh, leading the World War One Victory Parade down Pennsylvania Avenue up to a a temporary memorial, a temporary arch that was erected uh, just north of the White House at, between the White House and Lafayette Square. Um, and then there's a more contemporary view giving essentially the same perspective, looking down Pennsylvania Avenue toward the Capitol and the old post office. The site was designated as a site for a memorial to General Pershing back in the late 1950s, early 1960s. And then that planning effort got taken over by the Pennsylvania Avenue Development Corporation. Uh, at the end of the day, what was originally contemplated as a site that would be primarily a memorial to General Pershing and the American Expeditionary Forces that he commanded, uh, ultimately became something more of just a, a civic park. 
you see here, and I apologize that this is a bit fuzzy, but that's the resolution I've got, that the park is dominated by that water feature uh, with the visitor kiosk with the red awnings in the foreground. And then at the far end of the park is that uh, blocky water feature that has water cascading down all four sides and flowing into the pool. And then the, there, are, there are stone clad doors at the front of that structure. And actually the Zamboni machine would come out and resurface the ice when the pool was uh, converted to an ice skating rink in the winter months. And you can see that the Pershing Memorial is actually there in the lower left. Um, it's, uh, uh, there's another view of the precinct. It's got a statue of General Pershing. Uh, the wall on the right has some good text about the accomplishments of American Armed Forces in the war and a couple of good battle maps. Um, but this is what we were directed to when we were told the mall was not available. The Park Service said, look, we've already got this World War I Memorial at Pershing Park. Why don't you do something there? So we eventually took them up on their offer, but in our view, the existing site was not an appropriate National World War I Memorial, because in our view, the memorial element was shunted off to one corner of the park, uh, and the, the real focus of the park, that center of gravity focused on the pool, really turned its back on the Pershing Memorial, had little to do stylistically or thematically, or even physically or visually, uh, with the Pershing, uh, the Pershing Memorial there. The, the kiosk itself presented a visual barrier from significant parts of the park. And so in terms of the site plan, we did not think it was sufficient as it was to serve as a National World War I Memorial. And then of course, the site, a second big problem was the design of the site. If you're familiar with it, you'll, you'll know that it's surrounded on three sides by these, these high grassy berms that rise up to as many as 12 feet above the sidewalk. Uh, when you're walking along, particularly the southern edge or, or and, and most of the eastern or western edges of the park, you have no idea that there's anything there to go visit. Uh, it's a very self-contained withdrawn site. For a memorial, that's a mixed blessing. On the one hand, it does, as you'll see, pro provide a sense of uh, quiet, dignified enclosure. But on the other hand, it's invisible to the street. Um, and then along the north, uh, in the lower picture, you see you've just got the, the row of taxis and other parking that are itself a somewhat unsightly vis visual and physical barrier to the site. And then, of course, coming back to the theme of, of, uh, of maintenance and funding for maintenance, this is what the park had become. The concessionaire who ran the visitor kiosk and the ice skating facility pulled out 20 years or so ago. Um, and there was no real feasibility to restore that concession particularly given the uh, appearance of other ice skating rinks around downtown, notably the, uh, the National Gallery of Art Rink. And then the park, there were lots of plumbing and electrical and other issues, and the water feature was, was uh, shut down for a long time. We thought we would have free reign to redevelop the whole site, um, but then we learned that it too was considered a historically significant work of landscape architecture by a prominent American landscape designer named Paul Friedberg. So in addition to the usual design review, we had to go through 106. Um, real quickly, these are all the agencies that have a say in all the processes that you have to go through when it comes to designing a memorial. The ones in blue were the ones whose approval you have to get before you can design a memorial. These are all the individuals and agencies that have a voice in this between the Commission of Fine Arts, NCPC, the National Capital Memorial Advisory Commission and the 106 process. There are 24 different voices involved before you even get to the public and to consulting parties. A lot of different advice and, and requirements from a lot of different people that you have to navigate. That's a whole other hour conversation in its own right. The design process had 46 public meetings or interagency hearings or public hearings or interagency hearings, all of which is to say, like this design or not, it wasn't solely the product of the World War I Centennial Commission. It had the input and the sign off of a lot of other folks as well. At the end of the day, in my view, we preserved about 95% of the park. Uh, you can see here that the overall site plan is as it was. The terracing is the original terracing. We picked up those stones, we numbered them, we cleaned them, we repaired them, we restored them, we replaced them when necessary put them back where they were. 
Uh, we wanted to lower the berms to make the site more accessible, but we had to keep them their, their original height. The water feature is the original footprint of the, uh, of the initial water feature. Um, so there are three main additions or changes that we made. You can see here that we removed the visitor kiosk, which nobody thought should be retained. Uh, and we replaced it with what we call the Belvedere that you can see there in the center right, um, which is, do I have a picture of it? I don't. Um, gave us the opportunity to put a number of interpretive panels uh, for visitors to read, to learn about the war, not just the war fighting, but the social, cultural, political impacts that World War I had on this country and on the world at large. Because unlike the, war, the, the, the wars in the mall, we're three generations removed from World War I. Uh, there's not many folks left who know much about it. Um, we took out that, that water feature at the back of the pool and put in the sculpture wall, which I'll show you some details of in a moment. Uh, and then we built that viewing platform out over the pool so that people can approach the, the, the sculpture and view it close up. And also, as you see here, that can be a, a, a place for events. That's the army band and the color guard there on the platform. That square area of water in the middle is what we call a scrim. It's an eighth of an inch deep. Uh, it can be drained uh, to make that a plaza for memorial events, First Amendment events, uh, whatever people might want to use it for. Uh, here you can see in detail. That wall you see there actually sits in the pool itself. Uh, here's one of the architects rendering. Uh, you can see how the sculpture stands on top of a platform with water cascading down into the pool below the platform. And on the backside of that wall, you have water that comes all the way down from the top into the water. So we preserved the, audit, the auditory, the visual, the uh, temperature cooling, aspects of the original water feature, um, but we inserted a memorial element here to make this a worthy World War I memorial. That's a, uh, that's a glimpse of coming attractions. That is the first, what is that, 11 of what will ultimately be 38 figures in the sculpture, which tells the story of a recurring figure, an American soldier shown there on the left. Uh, and then again, in the central scene, as he goes off to war, goes through combat, experiences the shock and awe and the loss and the cost of the combat and eventually returns home. You see in the first scene, he takes his helmet from his daughter. In the final scene, he will hand his helmet back to his daughter. His daughter who represents the greatest generation will look into the helmet and see World War II. Um, within four days of opening, the site was being used for memorial events. Uh, the Belgian ambassador and the Belgian a uh, military chief came and set a wreath at the, uh, at the site. What you see in the background is a sketch of what the sculpture will be. The sculpture will be completed and installed in about two years. Uh, and for those who are worried that this site would be somber and oppressive and moody, um, you can see that people still find joy in it. Um, kids love to run through it. I've seen dogs playing in the fountain. People asked us, do you want people to stay out of the water? My response was, if they're in the water, that means they're there and that's what we want. So um, covered a lot of ground there. Don't know if we'll have time for any questions. In my view, this was a preservation success story, but I do recognize that we did alter the character of the site. But in my view, we altered it to restore it to the original intent of Congress as set forth back in the 1950s and 60s before the PADC converted this into a park. And I'll leave it there. Um, I encourage you to come on the walking tour on, on Saturday, and I can give a lot more detail on any aspects of this. And then one last note, we've given a nighttime use to the site that I don't think it had before. Mm -hmm. And with that, I will turn it over to Judy, I guess, to talk about a different war memorial. Okay. Thank you. Let me share my screen here. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Tomorrow, some of you will visit the World War II Memorial, which is located on a seven acre section of the mall, about midway between the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial. The memorial can look particularly attractive at night with lighting that emphasizes the water features and fountains in the center. When you enter from 17th Street on the east, 
you descend six feet down into the plaza. The memorial is sunken to minimize obstructing the view to the Lincoln Memorial. A large pool with fountains at the center of the plaza is framed to the north and south by 56 pillars and two triumphal arches representing the 48 states and US territories. The arches, one Pacific, the other Atlantic, refer to the theaters of war. Inscriptions carved into the walls and the side fountains refer to battle locations and quote speeches by General George Marshall and others who led the American war effort. Along the Western wall is a curved wall of gold stars. Each of the 4,048 stars represents 100 Americans who lost their lives. As you leave the plaza, you pass 24 bas reliefs showing scenes from the battlefront and the home front. The National Mall Coalition was founded directly in response to the controversy surrounding the creation of this memorial. In the mid 1990s, I was teaching art history at American University. After reading in 1997 an op-ed in the Washington Post by Senator Bob Carey of Nebraska, opposing the Rainbow Pool site, I joined the opposition. The opposition consisted of a number of members of Congress, the DC Preservation League, and many other organizations, art critics, and editorial boards of national newspapers. I had been teaching the history of the mall for some years, and was a strong believer in the brilliance of the historic 1791 L'Enfant Plan and 1901 to Macmillan Plan that are the blueprints for the mall, the great east-west axis from the Capitol to the Washington Monument and Lincoln Memorial, crossed by the north-south axis from the White House to the Jefferson Memorial. Citing the memorial at the Lincoln Memorial's Rainbow Pool, I believe, threatened to destroy that legacy's design integrity. Because of my historical knowledge, I was invited to join the board of both the DC Preservation League and the Committee of 100. This was my first foray into activism. By the end, some of us realized that there was no citizens group devoted specifically to advocate for the National Mall, but that one was needed. So in 2000, we founded the National Coalition to Save Our Mall, now renamed the National Mall Coalition. We included members of DCPL, the Committee of 100, and a group called World War II Veterans to Save Them All. If you want to learn more, the coalition's website includes a full archive of the history of the controversy. It's under Resources, World War II Memorial. No one among the opposition opposed the idea of a memorial to World War II. The major controversial issue was the choice of site, which required destruction of the Lincoln Memorial's rainbow pool the oval pool terminus at the east end of the reflecting pool. Building the memorial here would sever the uninterrupted connection between the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial. Originally, the sponsoring group, the American Battle Monuments Commission, considered seven potential sites. The Rainbow Pool was not one of them. In 1995, ABMC chose the site in Constitution Gardens to the north. But Carter Brown, chair of the Commission of Fine Arts, said that that site wasn't prominent enough for an event of the magnitude of World War II. He suggested moving it further south to the Rainbow Pool. In quick succession, ABMC, Commission of Fine Arts, the National Capital Planning Commission all agreed to the new site. In truth, many people, including I, thought that a discreet World War II memorial could respectably be put on this site. But the design competition put an end to that hope. And the completed memorial confirms the loss of the historic concept for the Lincoln Memorial Pools. A design competition in 1996 brought in hundreds of ideas. The jury chose a design by Friedrich St. Florian that called for replacing the Rainbow Pool with a large sunken plaza framed to the north and south by arcs of 40, 40 foot high columns. Behind the columns were 50 foot high berms enclosing two museum spaces. A museum component was part of the competition goals. I know this is a bit hard to believe for such a sensitive site on the mall. That original design, however, was rejected by Commission of Fine Arts and NCPC as too bulky and massive. 
1998, St. Florian returned with a revised design and CFA and NCPC gave preliminary approval. The sunken plaza no longer had columns or museum space. Instead, the plaza had two triumphal arches at north and south and a metallic fence lining the upper walkway. The National Park Service then issued a FONSI, finding that the new design would have no significant impact on the mall. But then in 1999, the design acquired new vertical elements, the 56 pillars. Unfortunately, by this time, Senator Kerry and others in Congress felt they'd won the fight and backed off. So it was left to us activists to continue the opposition. And this is where government took positive steps to save the day and save them all. The Advisory Council on Historic Preservation had been watching from afar. Now they decided it was time to take action. On August 28, 2000, the Advisory Council held a public hearing that was broadcast live on C-SPAN. It took place at the Department of Interior building to allow for hundreds of people and members of the public. Chairman Kathy Slater said, we want to hear what the public thinks of the proposal. The first speakers were Carter Brown and David Childs, chair of the National Capital Planning Commission. Both commissions had given approval to the site and the design. They both stated that this part of the mall was lonely and that there's nothing there. To counteract criticism that even with all the pillars, wreaths, inscriptions, and stars, there was no unifying message or meaning, they promised that rising from the center of the rainbow pool will be a light of freedom. Then dozens of people testified against the memorial. Cheryl Williams spoke for Congresswoman Helenor Holmes Norton, who had been an early and consistent opponent of the rainbow pool site. I was given the opportunity as an expert on mall history to present the history of the mall and the Lincoln Memorial's rainbow pool. I showed the National Park Service's own 1999 cultural landscape report for the Lincoln Memorial grounds that was clear and unambiguous. The rainbow pool was an integral component of the Lincoln Memorial grounds. DC Preservation League President David Bell testified that the plan was not a restoration but a demolition and reconstruction of the rainbow pool. Renowned DC architect and World War II veteran, Joe Passano, protested that the memorial was inadequate and out of place. And civil rights icon, Dorothy Height, asked for reconsideration of the proposal that would place the World War II memorial on the grounds of the Lincoln Memorial, a place charged with so much meaning for the civil rights community. We were all thrilled and grateful to the advisory council finding that the memorial would have quote, serious and unresolved adverse effects on the preeminent historic character of the National Mall. That official determination by a federal agency was the basis for the lawsuit brought in 2000 by the coalition, DCPL, the Committee of 100 and World War II veterans to save them all. We announced the lawsuit at a press conference at the Rainbow Pool site. Local preservation attorney Andrea Furster filed the suit. But ultimately, Congress stepped in to stop the lawsuit and expedite construction. On May 21, 2000, Congress passed legislation that, quote, notwithstanding any other provision of law, the World War II Memorial shall be constructed expeditiously at the dedicated Rainbow Pool site. The decision to locate the memorial and the actions by the federal commissions shall not be subject to administrative or judicial review. Looking back now, I see that it was action by Congress to terminate our legitimate and well-founded lawsuit that led us to create the National Mall Coalition. We were shocked and indignant. Who owned the mall, Congress or the American people? We felt Congress had not only overstepped the separation of powers guaranteed in the Constitution, but had decided that constructing the World War II Memorial was more important than protecting the brilliant legacy of the historic L'Enfant and Macmillan plans. What good are historic preservation laws if they can be undone at the whim of Congress? I'll end by asking you to have this question in your mind if you visit tomorrow. If our lawsuit had been allowed to proceed, 
using the strong arguments made by the advisory council. Would the memorial have been different? Maybe it would still be on that site, but more in keeping with the original concept for the Lincoln pools. Maybe the design could have been modified, opened at the west, so the pedestrians who entered from the Washington Monument side could continue through the memorial and on to the Lincoln Memorial. Maybe the missing central sculptural element, never completed, could have unified all the parts into a meaningful message about how the entire country, not only military, but also on the home front, came together in defense of freedom. For me and many others involved in the battle, the World War II memorial process was exhilarating, disillusioning, and ultimately a spur to try to improve preservation of the National Mall by taking up mall advocacy. Thank you. Melissa, before we get to questions, I want to tease out three, three thoughts that I think come from both Judy's and my, my mm -hmm. presentations. The first is more for mine. As I said, you know, preservation takes money. Uh, in the World War I project, we wound up performing about $14 million of restoration work to the site, independent of the new commemorative elements. Mm -hmm. And had, had we not developed that project, you know, I don't know when the Park Service would have come up with $14 million to restore it, to restore Pershing Park, given the other demands on its resources. Um, so that was a, uh, you know, again, if you lament the alteration to the Friedberg design, uh, you need to recognize that it's been put back to what it was, thanks and, you know, largely to our efforts. Second is, you know, as both Judy's and my remarks showed, the process in Washington is very complicated. A lot of different people have voices. It's designed by committee. In the case of World War I and largely in World War II, I think those processes were you know, uh, successful in, to some degree or another, you can debate the degree, I, I'm more favorably inclined to the World War II Memorial than, than, than Judy is, but they did reconcile and ameliorate many of the problems and concerns um, and get to a result that, that I think in both cases is a good compromise. It doesn't always work. We haven't talked about the Eisenhower Memorial, that's worth the whole other hour program, which I think was a failure of the, of the of the design by committee process, but more often than not, I think it comes to a, a, a good outcome that balances a lot of competing objectives. And the third is, this is Washington. Politics are going to come into it. Um, Congress designated Pershing Park as the site for the World War I Memorial and short-circuited the site selection process, in part because there already was that Pershing Memorial. Congress uh, carved out an exception to the Commemorative Works Act to put the War on Terror Memorial in the reserve. Um, going back to World War I, there were a couple points in the design process and in the funding process where if the chairman of our commission didn't have a direct line to Mitch McConnell, uh, it might not have happened. And we might not have got that $14 million to the restore the park. So politics are going to come into it, like it or not. You just have to be prepared for it and work with it. And, uh, and where you can take advantage of it. Yeah, um, Judy, Mark, do either of you have any thoughts to what Edwin had, has said? <laughs> um, well, politics does have a play, but otherwise there would be no DC Preservation League, Committee of 100, coalition if we didn't believe that principles sometimes come above politics. And we like to remind our members of Congress and like to remember, remind our federal agencies that some things are so transcendentally important, transcendentally important principles underlying the constitution, principles that are embodied in the, on the mall. I mean, we founded the, the coalition because we believe and we know that people all around the world love to come there because it is truly a very impressive embodiment of American fundamentals. So yes, po politics of course is gonna play a role um, and money of course is going to play a role. And if it comes to a military 
um, uh, memorial, it has a much better chance of succeeding than for instance, the memorial to Tom Paine or to other worthy themes. Um, but you know, the whole purpose of the nonprofit advocacy is to try to counteract the, the crass and maybe necessary politics with someone reminding them of the principle. Well, and Judy, you did have an effect on World War II. You didn't accomplish all you wanted, but you did have an effect. Um, uh, and you know, and 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 for that, you should you know, you rightfully take credit. And the preservation side on the World War One Memorial definitely had an effect uh, on the development of this that site. They didn't achieve all they wanted, but they but they achieved a lot in my mind. So it's worth the fight, even though sometimes the cards seem stacked against you. Well, now, what, to me, what was really stunning about the World War II, I think there would be no coalition. Um, we would not have, if the advisory council had not taken its strong role, it showed that the federal government did take its responsibility seriously. And therefore, we had good reason to believe that the government um, was on our side to some extent and, and that we had allies in government. If the advisory council had come back and said, look, you people have no position at all. There's nothing worthwhile. Lawfall and McMillan are old. Let's just put them to bed and move on to the new programs coming up with the bed. That would have been different. But what we were looking at was a, was a government that was actually doing its job and, and doing its preservation rule. And therefore we thought, well, heck, if government wants to do it, they need citizens to help them. And in a way, we were there to help the government be effective. So it's just a different way of looking. Well, and that's why I say you can the government itself, as you, you know, is many different pieces. And and so when I say take advantage of the fact that it's political, it's find those, you know, find the governmental levers that you can use uh, and, and counteract the other ones that are working against you. Uh, that's if I can put a comment in, um, a lot of my work over the last few two years has been about removing monuments. Mm -hmm. They are put up for political reasons with the goals of perpetuating in perpetuity our ideals. And we find that those ideals change over time and through politics. So I think it's imprudent of us to somehow assume that these can be separated from politics. It's through political impetuses that they are created and destroyed. Mm -hmm. And um, it may hopefully be less the case in the future, but it should be something perhaps we recognize that our ideals and what we believe now as uh, longstanding and permanent ideals of a nation may not be the case in the future. Mm -hmm. And one of our members, um, Kent Cooper, uh, he was on the board of the, the coalition. He, um, he was the architect of the Korean Veterans Memorial but he was also the architect of record for Maya Lin with the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. And he used to speak of how the Vietnam War is becoming a distant memory as generation past generation. And he said the one thing he thought was a very positive about the Vietnam Memorial is it was set into the soil and it could simply be filled in and a new monument be built over it or public use or recreational space. So he was thinking that way. People were always horrified when he said it, but he was absolutely correct that you know, the mon monument shouldn't be seen as you know, a monumental forever and ever, um, that we should have a little more modesty about um, what uh, we want to memorialize and how much on the mall, how much you know, granite we want to put and how much, um, how much open space we want to fill. So I'm, I'm totally in fact, what we used to joke about the World War II Memorial early in the early days, we could plant ivy all over it and it could, you know, grow into a very interesting green monument. Rebecca, did you have any thoughts at all about this? I'm very interested in this debate. I'll sit back <laughs> and eat my popcorn. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I think you all raised some really interesting points. Um, do we have any any questions? Uh, we haven't gotten any questions. I think everybody else is also sitting back and, and watching the, the conversation play out. But I do encourage folks, if you do have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat, put them in Q&A. Well, one um, thing I would like to say is, I mean, the coalition, when we got started in 2000, we knew that you can't fight Congress. You can't fight the Park Service and the NCPC and the commission. These people have authority, rightfully so, 
Um, but you can try to come up with new ways of thinking about some of these same problems. So from the beginning, we weren't, when we, when we started Save Our Mall, it was because we were trying to save our mall from overbuilding. But we soon learned the thing to do was educate people. We put out a little mall map and we've distributed about a million of them over the past few years. Um, and we came up with the idea that the L'Enfant Macmillan plans are really old and need updating since the last one was 1901 too. And we keep saying we need a new commission to come up with a new, a new plan that would allow the mall to grow, to accommodate the new needs, uh, to deal with the huge flooding issues that we have, mm -hmm. to deal with energy, clean energy and climate change issues. We don't have a plan like that. The Park Service did a mall plan, which is a maintenance plan. NCPC did a memorials and museums plan that identify sites off the mall. They did, they did an, a number of plans, but there's no plan that says the Smithsonian, the architect, the Capitol, the National Gallery, the Park Service are all gonna sit together with others, designers, planners, engineers, and the public, and come up with a vision of how the mall can represent where we are now mm -hmm. and what we have, uh, aspire to in the future. We've said the mall can grow. And I know when we first started saying this back in 2003, four, people were like, no, no, we have to preserve it just as it is. Why? In 1900, the mall ended at the Washington Monument. And then the Macmillan Commission took all the landfill to the West and South that the Army Corps had, done, had put and put the Lincoln Memorial and ultimately the Jefferson Memorial. We can expand again. We've got federal land on both sides of the Potomac. Um, which could be sites for new memorials and public activities and, and uh, you know, all the things that have been thrown off the mall, like the book festival and the solar decathlon, um, those kind of places should come back. They belong in, in Washington, where we can highlight America culture and our aspirations for the future. So, and, and recently, just last weekend, I had an op-ed in the Washington Post mm -hmm. about the wall does have places for new museums. Um, now, someone might say, oh, that's horrible. You're going to destroy the historic part of the mall. Well, if we think creatively, some parts of the mall have never been realized. And down by the Tidal Basin, north of the Tidal Basin, next to the Holocaust Museum, is a bunch of roads, a bunch of access roads. And if you're trying to walk from the Washington Monument to the Tidal Basin, you're likely to get run over. Why don't we just reorient the roads and we could make a couple of sites maybe for the two museums. It's on high ground, according to the Park Service's new flood maps. So, you know, we're, we're encouraging people to think, but when you're, when you're in a government agency following laws and rules that say the mall is a completed work of civic art, they're not allowed to even think creatively. And so we're ignored, but that doesn't stop us. <laughs> no, I agree with Judy 100%. The challenge in this is all these projects come up one by one. Uh, and it gets very frustrating. I'm, you know, I'm now ABMC's representative to the NICMAC. And, uh, you know, you've got the, you've got the, the uh, Desert Storm Memorial. It's not in the reserve. It's right across the street from the reserve. But for all practical purposes, it's on the mall. Um, and then you've got the War on Terror Memorial. Uh, going through site selection for a spot on the mall. I'd sure like to think we're not going to need any war memorials, but I'm realistic on that point. And so, you know, we need long range planning for how are we going to commemorate our wars? Um, uh, and, and, and can we do some holistic thinking about that as opposed to each one pops up one on its one, one by one? Museums are kind of the same way. Uh, Nick Mack is taking up legislation on Monday for the Latino Museum and the Women's History Museum. Um, it would be nice to have a more comprehensive process for thinking about what museums do we need and where should they be, um, and picking up on Judy's ideas that they don't all have to be on the mall. I hoped that we were doing a great service by going off the mall for the World War I Memorial. So that people could say, look, the World War One war, you know, the third bloodiest war in our nation's history uh, isn't on the mall. You don't rate a spot on the mall to be blunt about it. Um, you know, 116,000 died in World War One versus six or 7,000 in the War on Terror. If World War One can be on the mall, the War on Terror doesn't need to be on the mall. But there's no comprehensive planning and thought of the type that Judy's talking about. And I agree, that's a, that's a great, great one. That, that is missing. Mark, Rebecca, do either of you have any 
kind of thoughts on this at all? No, I think Edwin summed it up quite well, just because it is true that we, as advocates, we run into this situation where everybody wants to be on the mall. And so mm -hmm. when these, these uh, especially when you're competing with monuments and memorials and then the museums, as Edwin said, uh, it's very piecemeal at this point. And people, people select a site and they get focused on that site and nothing else will do for them. Uh, but the reimagining of what the National Mall really is and what hasn't been realized yet, I think is really important to the future uh, of the National Mall and also our advocacy efforts. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, I've got to run. Okay, thank well, you, Thanks Edward. for doing this. Lots of, uh, we could spend five more, spend five more programs out of these topics. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, All right. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity of joining this group. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very yeah, much thank for the opportunity. Thank you all so much. It was really wonderful to hear from you all. Thank you for participating.